video of a deadly police shooting. The suspect in a standoff with police after someone calls 911 about suspected drug use. A less lethal round is fired at Michael Ramos, who then gets in his car. Moments later, he attempts to pull away. Officer Christopher Taylor fires three rounds into the car. Ramos was later pronounced dead. Taylor is now on administrative leave while an investigation takes place. The incident sparking new protests. New evidence about how a possible vaccine may act quickly within days. The promising news comes just as Florida reports a record number of deaths in 24 hours. Growing concerns over mass gatherings as Major League Baseball struggles to contain a growing outbreak. President Trump under fire defending hydroxychloroquine in a controversial video he retweeted. The video now deleted by Twitter and Joe Biden going after the president with a new clue about his possible pick for a running mate. The anti-mask medical exemption, the argument being used by some refusing to cover up what doctors say about the excuse. Disaster in the making, the storm in the Atlantic right now and where it's taking aim. And Captain America bridging the political divide. How Chris Evans wants to improve our nation's discourse while holding elected leaders accountable. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. While many countries are now experiencing a resurgence of coronavirus, here in the U.S., we are still limping through round one. And there is new evidence tonight. The outbreak is on the move. 21 states reportedly in the hot zone. As we mentioned last night, the new outbreaks often follow so-called super spreader events, like this one in New York. The governor, Cuomo, tweeting out his outrage at a benefit concert in the Hamptons over the weekend. And after more Miami Marlins tested positive today, their season is now on pause as the manager of the world champion Nationals says he's scared to coach. The Nationals, however, still playing tonight along with 27 other teams. But we begin with the growing signs of hope in the race for a vaccine. Not one, but two trials now in the U.S. injecting volunteers. And if all goes well, these shots could change the entire course of this pandemic. Our Victor Kendo leads us off tonight from Miami. Just one day after Moderna's vaccine trial started its critical final phase of human trials, new evidence the vaccine might act quickly. Seven of eight primates injected with the vaccine showed no detectable virus in their lungs just two days after exposure. Dr. Anthony Fauci is hopeful about Moderna's vaccine. I am cautiously optimistic that as we get into the late fall and early winter, we will have an answer, and I believe it will be positive. On Moderna's heels, pharmaceutical giant Pfizer launching the final phase of its vaccine trial with 30,000 volunteers. Volunteers at this point are going to be true heroes to help us determine which of these vaccines is best. And some of those volunteers will expose themselves to the virus right here in Florida, where it's raging. The state marking its deadliest 24 hours yet, 191 lives lost. The nation's second largest teachers union saying it will support members who moved to strike in areas that reopen classrooms without adequate safety measures. A new report from the White House Coronavirus Task Force obtained by the New York Times urges 21 states with outbreaks, so-called red zones, to put more restrictions in place. Task Force Coordinator Dr. Deborah Burks today urging people to avoid large groups. We are still seeing significant outbreaks occurring from birthday parties, graduation parties, um, family reunions. Across the country, concern after mass gatherings like this church event on a California beach at a charity concert in New York's Hamptons. The governor tweeting out this video saying he was appalled, announcing an investigation. Organizers say they followed CDC guidelines and tried to ensure social distancing. And tonight, Major League Baseball season is in jeopardy. Now 17 Miami Marlins players and staff are infected, their season put on pause. The manager of the World Series champion Nationals admits he's nervous. Because of my heart condition, what happens you know, to me if I do get it? So I, I got to be extra careful. In nearby Baltimore, colleagues are mourning the loss of 56-year-old Dr. Joseph Costa, who ran the ICU at Mercy Medical, saying he had a wonderfully big heart. Doctors in Georgia spent 49 grueling days saving Michael Mullenix, who was on a ventilator for three weeks. And I want y'all to take this virus very seriously because it's not a joke. His entire family of eight contracted COVID. Michael was hit the hardest, despite not having any pre-existing conditions. <laughs> Staff celebrated when he was released, but his recovery is just beginning. Back home, we witnessed rare and difficult moments 
while we spoke with his mother, an occupational therapist started working with Michael. You squeeze my fingers hard you can. The former high school football player now unable to walk on his own. His voice is badly damaged from breathing tubes. This stuff is real. I know it's tough, but watching Michael go through that as a mother, what's it like? You never thought you'd see your son, you know, with all the tubes. I have a picture of him and his brother um, that I would put under my pillow and um, I didn't want to close it until he got home. Just such a difficult and, and heartbreaking time for, for so many right now. Victor Akendo joins us. In, and Victor, there are some hopeful signs from, from some of the troubled states, though, right? Lindsay, some of the numbers are improving across the Sun Belt, but they are climbing in other parts of the country. States like Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, and Tennessee. The way Dr. Anthony Fauci puts it, we cannot afford to see another surge. Lindsay? We certainly cannot. Victor Kendo, thanks so much. And turning now to the White House, where President Trump is under fire for his mixed messages about the coronavirus after he retweeted a video of a doctor denouncing the wearing of masks and promoting that controversial drug hydroxychloroquine. Here's ABC's chief White House correspondent, Jonathan Carl. Tonight, even as his own health experts urge more states to tighten restrictions, President Trump is once again downplaying the COVID-19 threat and hyping a discredited treatment. Uh, many doctors think it is extremely successful, the hydroxychloroquine. This after the president again used his Twitter account to spread misinformation, tweeting video of a doctor denouncing the use of masks and promoting hydroxychloroquine, the controversial anti-malaria drug the president's top health officials have warned is ineffective and potentially dangerous as a COVID-19 treatment. That doctor, who was only licensed to practice medicine in Texas last November, has a history of outrageous statements, such as saying health problems can be caused by demons. Dr. Fauci attempted to set the record straight on GMA. The overwhelming prevailing clinical trials that have looked at the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine have indicated that it is not effective in coronavirus disease. President, the woman that you said was a great doctor in that video that you retweeted last night said that masks don't work and there is a cure for COVID-19, both of which health experts say is not true. She's also made videos saying that doctors make medicine using DNA from aliens and that they're trying to create a vaccine to make you immune from becoming religious. Well, maybe it's the so, same, maybe it's not, but I, I can't, I can tell you this. That. She was on air along with many other doctors. Uh, they were big mm -hmm. fans of hydroxychloroquine. And I thought she was very impressive in the sense that from where she came, I don't know which country she comes from, but she said that she's had tremendous success with hundreds of different patients. And I thought her voice was an important voice, but I know nothing about her. The misinformation and mixed messages undercut the president's effort to show the American people he is fully engaged in the fight against COVID-19. Just last week, he had said things may get worse before they get better, and for three days in a row, he urged people to wear a mask. To wear a mask, get a mask, uh, whether you like the mask or not, uh, they have an impact. Wear a mask, socially distance, and repeatedly wash your hands. We ask all Americans to exercise vigilance, practice social distancing, wear a mask. The president has insisted he's been on top of the virus since the beginning, pointing to his decision to restrict travel from China in late January. But the head of the CDC, Robert Redfield, now acknowledges the administration was slow to recognize that travelers from Europe were bringing the virus to the United States. The introduction from Europe happened before we realized what was happening. And by the time we realized Europe threat and shut down travel to Europe, there was already probably two or three weeks of 60,000 people coming back every day from Europe. And that's where the large seating came in the United States. Redfield's acknowledgement is part of a months long investigation by ABC News. American catastrophe. How did we get here? Our thanks to Jonathan Carl and Joe Biden today sounded off on the president's handling of the pandemic and the former vice president also announced when we'll learn who he'll choose as a running mate. ABC's Mary Bruce was on the campaign trail today and has the very latest. As President Trump spreads misinformation on the pandemic, Joe Biden today said the country can't fight the virus if they can't trust the president. People are losing faith in what the president says. And if a president repeatedly says things to you that are not true, 
And then there comes a time when they say, I have something that I think can cure you, but it could really hurt you. You're not going to listen to the guy who says been lying to you. As coronavirus cases soar, Biden says it didn't have to be this way. So we asked, what would he be doing differently? Are there specific states right now that you think should halt their reopenings and roll things back? And if so, which states? The president has had given us a false choice. He said that we have to get back to work and also deal with COVID. You can't get this country going again unless you get COVID under control. And so he has been really late in the game. And to be clear, have you been tested yet? No, I have not. Biden says Trump is looking to change the subject by sending federal agents into the Portland protests. This isn't about law and order. It's about a political strategy to revive a failing campaign. Every instinct Trump has is that fuel to the fire. The former vice president today laying out his plan to fight racial economic inequality. In good times, communities of color still lag. In bad times, they get hit first and the hardest. And in recovery, they take the longest to bounce back. This is about justice. And he had an announcement about a big announcement, saying he'll make public his choice for vice president next week. I'm going to have a, a choice in the first week in August, and uh, I promise I'll let you know when I do. All right, so the first week of August it is. Mary Bruce joins us now from Wilmington. So tell us more about what Joe Biden said on his VP search. Will he be able to meet with his top contenders before making a final choice? And who is in that top tier right now? Well, of course, this process, like everything else right now, has been upended by the pandemic, and Biden was asked if he's been able to actually meet face-to-face -face with any of these finalists, and he wouldn't really comment. We, of course, have been keeping a very close eye on who he's been interacting with, but it's simply not clear if in this environment he's able to actually sit down and get to know uh, some of these potential running mates of his. Here's what we do know. The vice president is going to be a woman. Some on the list are fairly well-known, like his former rival Senators Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren. Others, though, uh, may be lesser well-known to most of the country, like Congresswoman Karen Bass. She's the head of the Congressional Black Caucus. Biden is under a lot of pressure to pick a woman of color, and he has said that there are four on the list. The only thing we know for certain right now, Lindsay, is that we don't have to speculate much longer. This announcement is coming next week. All right, Mary Bruce, thank you so much. And on Capitol Hill tonight, it does not appear that Republicans are any closer to a deal with Democrats or each other on a new stimulus package. The stimulus will expire on Friday, and with it, the $600 a month unemployed Americans have been getting for several months. Steve Mnuchin and Mark Meadows met with Nancy Pelosi late today, and both sides say they are no closer to a deal. Also, up to half of the Republican conference may not support the GOP's own proposal. And there's growing concern tonight among GOP senators that if the Republicans can't get on the same page, the Democrats will ultimately get to shape a large portion of the bill. For more now on the negotiations in Congress on the next economic relief bill, we're joined now by Illinois Senator Tammy Duckworth. Senator, thanks so much for your time. Good to be on. Thank you. So you released a statement that was very critical of Republicans for failing to address the economic deadlines that were looming and for also proposing to cut back those expanded unemployment benefits. But what's your response to Republicans who argue that those expanded benefits were meant to only be temporary and that continuing them at the $600 level will only discourage Americans from going back to work if they can simply stay home and make more money? Where are they going to go back to work? We are shutting restaurants back down. We're shutting in all sorts of places. A lot of the economy that was opening up, we're shutting back down because this president has failed to provide the testing or any type of a coordinated response to COVID-19. Where are these people going to go to work? That's my question to them. The additional $600 a month are keeping many families afloat. Remember that if you're out of work, that you're paying for your health insurance out of pocket, for example. Uh, our working families desperately need this money, and it's very cruel that my Republican colleagues would take this money away from working families at the same time that they are putting all sorts of little 
uh, favors in there, bonuses in there for large corporations and, and for the Trump administration. And you've also argued that Republicans should vote on the Democratic House's $3 trillion CARES Act. But as you know, Republicans have deep divisions on even spending a trillion dollars on additional aid right now. So if the sides are so far apart, would it be more practical to work on a short-term deal to temporarily expand those unemployment benefits and address issues like extending the moratorium on evictions and foreclosures rather than a massive bill that may take weeks to negotiate? Well, I think that we need to keep it all together in order to move it forward in a comprehensive way. To respond to this pandemic piecemeal just is not a viable process. You know, we need to make sure that we have money for, for example, more testing. We have to make sure there's more money for hospitals and healthcare providers and nursing homes. You know, they don't put any money in here for nursing homes, and yet that is where so many Americans are dying right now. Um, this is a complex problem, and we need to pull together a solution that can address many of the issues. If we pass uh, one thing at a time, what's going to happen is that we're going to leave some folks behind and we can't afford that. They don't put enough money in here for schools. And, and, and yet they want students to go back to school full time. You know, I have a five-year-old daughter. I want her to go back to school, but not if she's going to catch this pandemic because this White House has failed to respond to it. I can sympathize. I have a six-year-old at home as well. So let's focus for a moment on funding for schools and child care, where there does seem to be some semblance of common ground. You recently tweeted, like so many, I'm scared that I'm my kid's sole source of education right now. I'm a pilot and senator, not an educator. But if schools open, it it must be done safely, and this COVID-19 relief bill must include paid leave and child care to give families the support they need. So do you see some opportunity for agreement on funds for schools, and, and where do you think the GOP bill falls short? Well, I don't think there's enough money in here for schools. Um, I do think that we need to have paid leave uh, because that goes hand in hand with testing and responses. If someone cannot get low cost or free testing when they need it, um, uh, their people are going to go back to work because uh, they can't afford to miss a paycheck. Um, but then folks are faced with, do I leave my child at home by themselves with no child care while I go to work? How does that work out? Uh, we need some sort of paid leave so people can take time off if they do come down with this illness to stay home or to take care of a loved one so they don't spread the disease, the uh, COVID-19 around uh, the community. But then also we need to make sure that there's adequate child care so people can go back to work. Even with more funding, do you realistically think that schools will be able to safely reopen for in-class instruction in a matter of weeks, or should parents assume that remote learning will be a major part of schools this fall? Well, unfortunately, I think that remote learning will be a major part of what happens in schools just because this administration has failed to provide any guidelines or any assistance to schools for how they should open. Um, President Trump talks about sending kids back to school, and yet the Department of Education under Betsy DeVos has not actually put forward any uh, comprehensive guidelines or assistance to schools on how they can do this. Schools are on their own to try to figure out how they're going to maintain separation between students. Uh, there's not enough money in this package that allows schools to, for example, buy additional PPE or pay for additional cleaning. Um, I've been homeschooling my daughter for four months, and I will tell you, it is tough. I want her to go back to school because I, I worry that she's falling behind, but I don't want her to get sick. I don't want her to die, and that's, I think, where most American families are. Yes, we want our kids to go back to school, but uh, not at the expense of their health. And I just want to switch gears for a moment. As you know, many people are talking about you reportedly being on Biden's shortlist as a potential vice Vice presidential candidate. I'm sure you don't want to speculate on your chances, but make the case for why you think you'd be prepared to be vice president if Joe Biden were to give you the tap on the shoulder. Well, any of the wonderful um, uh, women's names who have been mentioned, and there are lots of names that get mentioned, uh, are well qualified. Uh, I think what needs to be uh, discussed is the fact that the Biden administration is going to face multiple crises. They're going to be facing an economic crisis, a global pandemic crisis, a crisis that has to do with national security. You know, President Trump still has not done anything about these Russian bounties on American troops' heads in Afghanistan. He's going to be dealing with uh, making sure that uh, we get help to all of our municipalities who are struggling right now. Um, when we talk about healthcare, it's not just a pandemic, but it's also the survival of our hospital networks. And so, um, you know, any one of us can step up and do a good job. And, and I think it's all about being part of the team. And, and Joe Biden will decide 
who he needs next to him and what position. I'm team Biden and I'm happy to play, you know, catcher or, or, or I, I used to be a second baseman. So, you know, whatever, whatever position on that team that will help us find the wounds of this country and pull us out of this crisis that the Trump administration has gotten us into, I'm happy to do that. How important is it that it's a woman of color? I think it's very important that it's a woman of color. You know, I do think that we are having a lot of discussions right now about racism and the divides within our country. President Trump has time and again uh, tried to uh, go after Asian Americans in particular. He's talked about the Chinese virus. He's called it Kung Flu virus. Um, uh, you know, and, and we've seen Chinese Americans come under attack. Uh, I myself have come under, has come under attack recently. It's very easy to see Asian Americans as the other, that we're not truly Americans, and yet, we love this country as much as anyone else and, and have contributed to this nation. So I think that it's important for the diversity of our nation to have representation in the very highest levels of office. Senator Tammy Duckworth, we so appreciate you coming on the show tonight. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Next to the fireworks on Capitol Hill today, Attorney General William Barr testifying before the House for the first time defending himself against accusations that he lacks independence from the White House, including over the sentencing of Roger Stone. And the Attorney General confronted over sending federal troops to cities where protests are po over policing are still raging. Here's ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas. Tonight, Attorney General William Barr under attack. In your time at the department, you have aided and abetted the worst failings of the president. For the first time taking questions from the House Judiciary Committee, Barr under fire on several fronts. Democrats accusing him of trying to help the president in his re-election campaign, sending law enforcement to Democratic-led cities. Yes or no, have you discussed the president's re-election campaign with the president or with any White House official or any surrogate of the president? Well, I'm not going to get into my discussions with the president, but I've made it clear that I would like to pick the cities based on law enforcement need and based on neutral criteria. But you, you can't. But Barr saying the violence in Portland justifies federal action. What unfolds nightly around the courthouse cannot reasonably be called protest. It is, by any objective measure, an assault on the government of the United States. Republicans helping Barr make his case. Are peaceful protests violent, Mr. Attorney General? No. Do peaceful protests destroy businesses? No. Do peaceful protests injure officers? No. Democrats were not having it, accusing Barr of a double standard. There is a real discrepancy in how you react as the attorney general, the top cop in this country, when white men with swastikas storm a government building with guns, there is no need for the president to, quote, activate you because they're getting the president's personal agenda done. And with 98 days until the election, Barr also pressed about election interference. Is it ever appropriate, sir, for the president to solicit or accept foreign assistance in an election? It depends what kind of assistance. Is it ever appropriate for the president or presidential candidate to accept or solicit foreign assistance of any kind in his or her election? No, it's not appropriate. Lizzie, often Democrats did not give Barr a chance to respond. And at times he was defiant and even irritated. Lindsay? And as Pierre mentioned, the attorney general defended the federal response in Portland. Protests went until late into Monday evening, and today word more federal agents are headed to Portland as officials there brace for yet another long night. Arcana Whitworth has been there this entire time. Kana, so what's the latest in the situation right now? Well, certainly, Lindsay, the protesters here are not backing down. In the meantime, the mayor is calling for a ceasefire. He also says that he wants to meet with the DHS officials that are here on the ground and the acting secretary, Chad Wolf. In addition to that, the commissioners are attempting to access a fine from the federal government, $500 for every 15 minutes that fence is up around the federal courthouse. And, Lindsay, night after night, that fence is a target for the protesters and the rioters. That's how things really start off every night. When they start to attack that fence, federal agents issue warnings, and then things carry on in violence throughout the night. And, Kate, when the president and federal leaders say Antifa is a problem in Portland, there have been reports of confrontations with Antifa in Portland even before the recent unrest and the death of George Floyd. And community leaders that you've talked with say that the violence is taking away from the message. What are they saying that they want? Yeah. <laughs> 
You know, Lindsay, it's so important that people hear them when they ask to stop the violence. They do not condone this violence. The leaders that I spoke with last night said they come there every night. I mean, their voices are hoarse. They're there every night having important, powerful conversations with people that are there to support them. They say they're intentional with their time, and then they want people to leave. Take a listen to what they had to say. Are you out here protesting for Black Lives Matter? Are you out here protesting for destruction? I don't care what it is, but you need to understand why you're out here. I know why I'm out here, and that's why I'm out here. That's why I read those words. That's why I read George Floyd's last word, because it was uncomfortable. Every day for me as a black man is uncomfortable. You need to be uncomfortable to get through this, all right? If you're not here for the right reasons, then why are you here? So ask yourself, why are you out here protesting? Actions speak louder than words, and if they say that they are supportive, but they are out here and if they're partying and if they are uh, unneeded, unneeded fires and unneeded violence, uh, then I don't know. Lindsay, that young woman that we just heard from, she's 24 years old. She told us last night, racial equality will happen in my lifetime. She's committed, and it's, again, very important that we hear what they have to say. Not taking no for an answer, and we've heard reports of tear gas being used on peaceful demonstrations. Uh, you yourself, along with your producers, were tear gas last night while covering the protests. Let's take a look. Yeah. And this is the first round of gas that we've seen here tonight. Authorities just now launching it after issuing several warnings. Tell us what happened last night. Kind of walk us through what you're, if you experienced. Yeah, so Lindsay, it's sort of what we see night after night here. People start to attack that fence. Then they're throwing fireworks over the fence. They're lighting fires on the inside of that barricade. Uh, they're really almost, you know, baiting these federal agents to come out. And that's what we see night after night. So the agents issue several warnings and then they take action. And they take action with that gas. Lindsay, I can tell you from our experience last week after being in the tear gas, what we were in last night was much stronger. Uh, our security team said they think it's CS gas. I mean, it was burning our skin, any exposed skin that we had. It's really hard to come back from that, but I tell you, the protesters do. They disperse, and then they're right back. Kane, a really impressive reporting you've been doing on the ground for us, Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Tensions once again escalating with Iran after they held a military exercise in one of the world's most vital shipping lanes. Iranian TV footage of the war game showed missiles being launched from land, sea and air and an assault on a replica aircraft carrier that resembles those from the U.S. Navy. U.S. officials are calling the exercise in the Strait of Hormuz irresponsible and reckless. Today, the Trump administration announced a formal review of the DACA program and saying that no new applications will be allowed. Renewals for current DACA recipients will be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis and any extensions will last one year. Now, this announcement comes after last month's Supreme Court ruling that rejected the administration's attempt to completely end the program. Pro-DACA groups have called the administration's latest move, quote, arbitrary and capricious. And when we come back, the deadly shark attack, believed to be the first ever in one state. We'll tell you where and more about what a pair of kayakers did when they saw what was happening. The mystery seeds being mailed across the country and the warning, who is sending them? Plus, we have seen the fights and confrontations over masks. Well, up next, we drill down on the concerns of those who say they shouldn't have to wear them for legal or medical purposes. Is there merit to those claims? We'll ask the experts. Welcome back. As COVID cases surge across the U.S., more than 30 states now require people to wear face masks in public. Several states even mandate masks while exercising outdoors. But some Americans are still adamantly refusing to comply, invoking legal and medical exemptions that they say allow them to live mask free. So who is exempt and why? ABC's Devin Dwyer now with the fact versus fiction.
I think it's a political hoax and I am against the masks. The blowback against face masks setting off some explosive confrontations. You're I coming close friends. to me. You're coming close Back to me. Off. Masked customers calling out the unmasked. At this Walmart, it nearly set off a brawl. In Dallas, the mask requirement sending one grocery shopper into a rage. I don't give a As more states mandate masks in public, some Americans are loudly claiming legal and medical exemptions. I have a breathing problem. My doctor would not let me wear a mask. So anyone harassing me to wear a mask, you guys are violating federal law. Official looking cards like this one circulating on social media say mental and physical risks make it unsafe for the holder to wear a mask. Under the Americans with Disabilities Act, it reads, I'm not required to disclose my condition. The Justice Department calls the cards a fraud. It's unfortunate. It's the same as people putting a handicap sticker on their car and using a spot that was designated for someone else. The ADA, which was signed 30 years ago this week, requires businesses to reasonably accommodate people with disabilities and medical conditions, but not at the expense of public health. The Trump administration saying the law does not provide a blanket exemption to people with disabilities from complying with legitimate safety requirements necessary for safe operations. It really boils down to that discussion with the patient and seeing what's best for them at the time. Dr. Albert Rizzo with the American Lung Association says people with concerns about masks should talk with their doctors. According to the CDC, children under age two, anyone unconscious or incapacitated, and people who have trouble breathing should not wear face masks. If an individual has advanced lung disease, that for example, they're already on supplemental oxygen at home, especially if they're also considered somebody who retains carbon dioxide, that's probably the highest risk group to then put a mask on them and have them breathe through it for any period of time. Medical experts say most of those people probably shouldn't be out in public anyways. And they say individuals with chronic conditions like asthma or COPD are not at heightened risk from wearing a mask unless they're in active respiratory distress. Any type of barrier that you're putting on um, is important. And you know, N95 masks, again, have been used for many years uh, in protection of individuals. Most Americans, nearly 90% in a recent ABC News poll, say they regularly wear a face covering when leaving home. Only one in 10 still choose to go mask free. Yes, All the Rachel, people calling me selfish. You're the one who's trying to yes. force me a medical procedure so they you do. can feel more safe. That's Opponents of face masks insist the coverings do more harm than good. I think the mask, what we're, what we're doing is we're breathing in the CO2 over and over again. You know, that's what we exhale to get the, the mask up out. So to breathe that in, it causes some damage. But those claims are not always backed up by science. These materials are designed to restrict small particles, not to restrict gas exchange. So oxygen and carbon dioxide are much smaller molecules than the actual viral particles. So again, the, the science doesn't seem to support significant retention of CO2. Do masks reduce our oxygen intake? Studies have shown a slight drop of oxygen in healthcare workers who use these for hours at a time. And yes, there are some headaches noted, but the oxygen drop is minimal. Dr. Anthony Fauci echoing the point in a recent Facebook Live interview. There has not been any indication that putting a mask on and wearing a mask for a considerable period of time has any deleterious effects on oxygen exchange or anything like that. Not at all. While they may be safe, most agree face masks are not always comfortable. Several states allow exemptions during vigorous exercise, and scientists say the volume of air outdoors likely dilutes any virus particles exhaled. But the biggest challenge may be for people with neurodevelopmental disorders like autism. There are a lot of sensory issues that autistic people can deal with. And, um, and my kids are, are no exception to that. Rob Gorski of Canton, Ohio, is a father of three autistic sons. He says overcoming anxiety from a face covering took creativity and determination. <laughs> they tried it first, and then it was, it was too uncomfortable, it was too itchy. Um, and so what we would do is we just practiced. Like I would we'd go for a drive just to get out of the house and I would have them wear their mask. The American Lung Association and other top lung health groups are encouraging people who want an exemption from mask mandates to weigh their concerns against societal needs to mitigate the spread of the virus. 
For Rob, Elliot, Emmett, and Gavin Gorski, those societal needs are paramount, even if they say those masks seem downright unbearable sometimes. It's the responsible thing to do. Um, I know, like my kids, it wasn't easy, but I'm telling you, like, if my kids can do it, all of these people out here who are, who are complaining about it being uncomfortable, they, 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 don't, they don't have a leg to stand on. For ABC News Live, I'm Devin Dwyer in Washington. Our thanks to Devin for that. And tonight, an exceptional ABC News primetime special, American Catastrophe, the inside story of how the U.S. lost control of the coronavirus outbreak after this show here on ABC News Live at 8 p.m. You'll also hear from the scientists who sounded the alarm in the weeks before the crisis reached our shores. And at 9 p.m., an in-depth investigation at the systemic breakdown that took place. That's tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern on ABC. For more now on the Trump administration's pandemic response and the question of how we got here, we bring in former Veterans Affairs Secretary David Shulkin, who served under President Trump and President Obama. Thanks so much for joining us. Glad to be here. Now, you left the Trump administration in 2018, well before this pandemic. But having led America's largest health care system under this president, what can you tell us about President Trump's approach to public health and also his leadership style and, and how it compares to President Obama's? The role of government, the role of a president, is to protect its citizens. And traditionally, people haven't thought about that in terms of a health crisis. But clearly now, I think the country understands the role of government and the role of the executive branch in leadership of a pandemic like this is absolutely critical. And we planned for that in the Obama administration. In fact, there was a tabletop exercise in January of 2017, right before the inauguration, where we had a scenario just like this, which was to prepare for a viral pandemic. And so uh, every administration needs to have a plan. It needs to have a backup plan. It needs to have people that are capable of implementing that plan. And unfortunately, what we've seen is really a very uncoordinated, fragmented plan being implemented in this country. And you wrote in your book that President Trump ran what you called a, quote, shadow government, that he often relied on the advice of a few government outsiders instead of his own officials. Do you suspect that he's still doing that? I think the president uh, always likes to get advice from outside people. He's very uh, eager to hear from people who may offer ideas. And that is a challenge, particularly when you're a inside person, a person who's been in government and used to having a formal chain of command to have people giving advice from the outside that you don't know what that advice is and you don't get a chance to necessarily hear that. So it makes it challenging to be with the administration with that type of style. But, you know, that's up to the president where he wants to get his information from. So really curious to hear your response. I mean, President Trump has said many times that no one could have seen this pandemic coming. Is that true? Why do you think that he continues to say that? Well, first of all, um, pandemics aren't anything new. There tend to be about three pandemics every century, and that's why government prepares for it. That's why you had a pandemic office in the uh, Obama administration. That's what the CDC does in terms of monitoring. We actually had people all across the world, especially in China, who work for the CDC to actually pick up and do this type of surveillance because pandemics are predictable. We had one in 2002. We had the Ebola pandemic. And so this should not be a surprise that they come. Now, you know, this pandemic is hitting the United States in a way that hasn't happened in 102 years, but uh, it is the job of government to prepare for these types of disasters and emergencies. And why do you think it's hitting the U.S. especially hard? Well, I think that we just haven't done a good job of implementing a national strategy. You know, I've run big organizations. I've been the CEO of large hospital systems. Uh, I don't have multiple strategies when I lead an organization. I have a singular strategy. And you lead organizations with principles, and you consistently put those principles into operation. And what we've done here in this country is we've delegated that to 50 different governors who each have decided to do their own strategy. And unfortunately, Americans just don't operate that way. They don't they don't stay within state lines and people travel. The virus doesn't travel. But that means 
that uh, we just don't have an effective national coordinated strategy when it comes to testing or in terms of uh, restricting the spread of the virus. And as you well know, the Trump White House disbanded the National Security Council's pandemic planning office in 2018. How much do you think that that's crippled our COVID-19 response? And what might have happened, would you say, if that office had stayed intact? Well, I think that's a big uncertainty. Um, I think that we already know that there were people in the White House that were aware early on and concerned about the implications of this type of worldwide pandemic. But if people don't listen to the advice, if they don't take the action, uh, even having a pandemic office that was aware of this doesn't necessarily mean that we would have had a different result than we uh, have seen here. But certainly, I think that um, you want to have high level people who can get the ear of the president, who can take actions, who really could develop that type of national strategy. Now, we got off to a very bad start in this pandemic because of our lack of preparedness in diagnostic testing. And as soon as we got behind in that, we really haven't caught up since. We need to make sure that we do better in the future. Secretary Shulkin, we thank you so much for your insight and your time. Thank you. And still ahead here on Prime, we are tracking the tropical storm threat in the Atlantic. It may be near Puerto Rico by Thursday and possibly closing in on the southeast coastline days later. Our conversation with Chris Evans, the actor best known as Captain America, now setting his sights on helping to bridge our political divides. Plus, pandemic fashion, or some would say lack thereof, leggings and sweatpants making a comeback while formal wear and even jeans are on the outs. But first, our tweet of the day. Hockey season has resumed and this is how Pennsylvania's two teams marked the occasion. Welcome back, everybody. We now take a look by the numbers at how the pandemic is not just upending our lives, but also our wardrobes with more Americans working from home and opting for comfort over high fashion during these discomforting times. Nearly half, 47 percent of consumers say they've been wearing the same clothes throughout their day during the pandemic, according to a survey by NPD Group. And 24 percent said that all day their outfit is active wear, sleepwear or loungewear. Overall clothing sales have dropped 39 percent since this time last year, according to census data. Formal wear sales for men is down 74 
4% and down 68% for women, according to global data. Even Levi's jeans reported a 62% drop in revenue last quarter as some consumers seem more inclined toward stretchier, more comfortable pants. Legging sales are up almost 10% and sweatpants sales up 6%. I know that I've personally contributed to that. And to keep Americans moving, running shoe sales, those are up 30%. Still a lot more to get to here on Prime. The COVID baseball concerns tonight only growing with more players on one team testing positive. In the movies, he helped save the universe, but can he make a difference with our politics in real life? Our conversation with Chris Evans and some encouraging news in the fight against Alzheimer's. But first, here are some of the trending stories on ABCnews.com. virus outbreak continues to grip much of the country with new cases on the rise in 28 states. Florida is especially hard hit. Florida reporting a record single day death toll of 191 people. On Capitol Hill, Congress is trying to hammer out a new stimulus bill, but so far negotiations are stalled, saying the current payment discourages people from working. When you pay people not to work, what do you expect? House Speaker Nancy Pelosi declaring Republicans are not ready to seriously negotiate. Fiery testimony on Capitol Hill, where Attorney General William Barr is testifying before the House Judiciary Committee. Democrats accusing and Barr of politicizing the Justice Department. In, in your time at the department, you have aided and abetted the worst failings of the president. Yes or no? Have you discussed the president's re-election campaign with the president? I'm a member of the cabinet and there's an election going on. Obviously, the topic so comes the up. Democrats accuse Barr of showing political favoritism in his handling of big cases related to the president and his allies. I'm supposedly uh, punishing the president's enemies and helping his friends. What enemies have I indicted? Barr has also been under scrutiny for his role in sending federal officers to help control mass protests in America cities. We're not out looking for trouble. Major League Baseball, new outbreaks have some questioning if the season can continue. Three games have been postponed after more than a dozen players and staff of the Miami Marlins tested positive. We're taking risks every day. It's fair to say that guys are concerned. MLB Commissioner Rob Manfred says for now the season will continue. We expected we were going to have positives at some point in time. You know what, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm scared. The first ever fatal shark attack off the coast of Maine. 
appears the female may have been attacked by some sort of animal. 63-year-old Julie Demperio Hollowak was attacked while swimming with her daughter 20 yards off Bailey Island. Kayakers brought her to shore, but she did not survive. Her daughter was able to swim to safety. The shark was, in fact, a great white. Authorities say Hollowak was swimming in a wetsuit, and the shark may have mistaken her for a seal. Outside New York City, officials closed a more than 15-mile stretch of beaches to swimmers after multiple shark sightings today. Lifeguards spotting a bull shark on Monday. A possible blood test for Alzheimer's. Researchers say a newly developed test is accurately detecting the disease in patients. They say it can make it easier and less expensive to diagnose the illness. The test is still in its early stages and won't be available for at least two or three years. The findings published in JAMA. New warnings for Americans about packages arriving in the mail with seeds from China. I said, what is that? What is that? And he said seeds, and I went. The U.S. Department of Agriculture believes the unsolicited seeds being sent from China across the U.S. are part of a brushing scam, generating fake customer reviews. But the USDA says anyone who receives the seeds should not open them or throw them away. Rather, report them to their state plant regulatory agency. The seeds could introduce invasive species or threats to agriculture in the U.S. And welcome back. All eyes now on the new tropical threat in the Atlantic. It's expected to move near Puerto Rico by Thursday. Warnings have now been posted for Puerto Rico and large swaths of the Caribbean. It could be somewhere off the southeast coast by next week. We will be tracking it for you and keep you informed. And he helped save the universe as Captain America, at least in the movies. But now actor Chris Evans is turning his sights on helping to bridge the political divide. Our Kenneth Moten recently spoke with the star of Captain America about his new ambitious effort. In the heat of an election year like no other, the political rancor at an all-time high. Biden is a doddering fool. Sir, but but what, get back what is the get back to what George for President said. Trump? The man, the actor, the activist who says he's trying to cut through the noise, Chris Evans. I was watching the news, and it began by there just being something I didn't fully understand. It started with a political question three years ago. Evans, best known for playing Captain Steve Rogers, a.k.a. Captain America, on the big screen, curious about a real-life issue impacting Americans. I went to Google it, and it was just so uh, discouraging how, how tricky it was to try and navigate through the, the overwhelming uh, avalanche of information, just, just to get succinct, basic understanding of issues. I figured there might be a use of a sort of mechanism that could uh, demystify some of these issues and maybe create some engagement. Good stuff, guys. Good stuff. He went to work on a website to connect lawmakers with their constituents. Soon, he had a starting point. But the start, Evans admits, was a little rough. One of them I filmed in my bedroom on my laptop. Hi, I'm Chris Evans. If you're watching this video, it's because I'm hoping you'll be interested in being a part of a new media platform we're developing. And it was terrible. It was, it was embarrassing. The, the very beginning of the idea itself, it turns out a lot of people thought it was a, a joke. joke. Evans taking his idea to the man who's now the site's co-founder, actor, director, and longtime friend Mark Casson. So you get this idea from Chris. Did you think he was for real? I mean, I've known Chris for over 10 years. I know he's for real. Um, and I thought Did this you think I, I would have stuck with it had you not pushed me, Mark. For sure, I knew it was going to take some cajoling and like holding up a mirror a few times. And well, you know, remember this thing you said? Mark just loved it and then didn't leave it alone. Mark kept saying, We got to do this, we got to do this. This is a great thing. And yeah, sorry, keep going. But the two working with a team of developers, documenting every step of the process. Before the coronavirus pandemic, Evans and Kasson went to Washington a lot. We're going to have to get you a permanent office. <laughs> I don't know if I can handle sure. that. Yeah. Shaking hands, taking meetings, trying to sway lawmakers on both sides of the aisle to take part. When we would go to D.C., and if we did have the good fortune of sitting down with a few elected officials, when we were done with the interview, we said, you know, just listen, is there anyone else you can get us? Shamelessly, is there anyone else you can convince to come in and talk to us? And it just snowballed from there. Every time we returned to D.C., there were just more and more names on our list. The celebrity known for being vocal about politics, usually to his nearly 14 million Twitter followers. Chris, you've been pretty critical of President Trump and Republicans, but I recently read you pull back on some of those comments in preparation for the launch of a starting point. Was that the case? And if so, why? It, it wasn't that I pulled back on the comments. It's that, you know, I, it's a matter of trying to measure 
efficacy, impact, you know what I mean? The reason I do what I do on Twitter isn't just because I'm screaming into the void because I'm angry. It's because I'm trying to help. I'm trying to move the ball. I'm trying to be a role model. I'm trying to change minds. The amount of arguments I've seen, political discussions, where everyone's pulling information from arbitrary places, and we just go in circles. So the idea of trying to create a mechanism predicated on good information and, and engagement felt like it would have a far broader reach than anything I could do on Twitter. On the self-funded bipartisan online platform, no like or dislike buttons, no comments. Just three sections, starting points, elected officials giving two minute answers to questions, daily points and counterpoints, a discussion between two members from across the aisle. How does this site have a greater impact on what's happening right now, especially when you think about it's an election year and when you think about how divided the nation is? It all starts with participation, participation from the elected officials and giving their opinions. Hopefully, eventually, this can be the, the kind of benchmark of connectivity of where you get information from elected officials, where they speak about the issues of the day, where they stand by their opinions, what they believe in, what they're willing to fight for. A starting point, or ASP, has a growing list of elected officials across the country, including governors and mayors. So far, about 170 members of Congress now involved. I was excited to join a starting point because it gives average Americans access to crisp and concise answers to current questions. I was thrilled that Captain America asked me to join, but frankly, I was more excited to have a vehicle for communicating with Americans of all backgrounds. What I love about what Chris Evans and his team is doing, they're reminding us that we need to start by having a conversation. Like most things in Washington, word spread. And there's one civic engagement nonprofit with deep roots in D.C., the Close-Up Foundation, responsible for bringing tens of thousands of middle and high schoolers to Washington each year. The earlier you get started in that process, the more inclined you are to, to be active and engaged. So we want to start with that at a very early age. Uh, I think connecting young people and those voices to elected officials helps provide another platform to have young people heard. I also think that connecting people from those different backgrounds is really important. Close Up's Chief Development Officer Mia Charity teaming up with Evans. The foundation is now ASP's official education partner. I think teachers and school districts are, are looking for interactive ways to engage students. We've transitioned a bit more to helping support them online. And the partnership with a starting point is really going to enhance those resources, bring more connectivity uh, to what the conversations look like, connecting schools to schools across the country so that young people can understand that their voice is important. This close-up foundation, why is this education partnership so important? Because they're better than us. Because yeah, they've exactly. Been doing they know what they're doing far better than we do. Their guidance has been, has been paramount, and their mission is just, you know, kind of a North Star for us. We look to people who are actual experts, uh, whether it be elected officials or someone like Close Up, who is truly uh, solely dedicated to civic engagement uh, at a educational level. As for Evans, using that celebrity for good. This seems very fitting for them that you have the guy who's playing the character who says, I want you to be involved in standing up and saving our democracy and being involved in our democracy. This seems pretty fitting for you to be involved in something like this. Yeah, I guess that, that worked out well, right? What do you think? I think it works. Kenneth Moten, ABC News, New York. Captain America on and perhaps off screen. Our thanks to Kenneth. We'll be right back.
Stefan is textbook middle child. He is an overachiever. Like when he played football, he's the one who picks the team spirit back up. Stefan is so charismatic. He's the life of the party. You would know that he's an honor roll student. He's such an awesome father. It makes me proud. My family will never be the same without Stefan. What the world lost was a living example of someone doing the right thing in their day-to-day -day life. The passing of the bill AB 392 with the Stefan Clark Law for California will prevent other mothers from having to go through what I did with my son. That was a new PSA from the National Football League and Rock Nation focused on the tragic death of Stefan Clark, an unarmed 22-year-old who was fatally shot in his grandmother's backyard. The NFL saying in a statement, we want to continue to raise awareness for victims of systemic racism to ensure their stories are not forgotten. And before we go tonight, our image of the day, the coffin of civil rights icon John Lewis draped in flowers, the first black lawmaker to lie in state at the Capitol Rotunda. On Thursday, the late congressman who served the people of Georgia for more than three decades will be moved to Atlanta for burial. And we will have live coverage right here on ABC News Live. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us and good night.